All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining in. Uh, this is the third uh, session between Rocket and Rover. Uh, we have a great panelist uh, session today. Uh, we're going to be focusing on setting up early career and practice. So we have great um, topics. There's going to be three sections, so the, just to get you oriented on the format. Uh, there'll be question delivered after each of the sessions. So there'll be three breaks for questions. If anything comes up, put questions in the chat or the QA um, boxes and we'll, we'll address them uh, after each speaker. So um, just to introduce everybody, my name is Ryan Hutton. I'm a PGY4 resident at the University of Utah. My co-moderator is Josh No. He's a PGY3 resident at Stanford University. Uh, and without further ado, why don't we introduce the panelists? Yeah, so um, we're going to go through all three introductions now prior to uh, the start of the, um, the, the talks. Uh, I just wanted to start by introducing Dr. Trevor Royce. Uh, Dr. Royce is currently a uh, medical director at um, Flatiron Health, as well as a radiation oncologist at the Wake Forest School of Medicine, as well as the VA. Uh, he trained at the Harvard Radiation Oncology Program before joining the University of North Carolina as an assistant professor in radiation oncology prior to his current roles. Uh, we're pleased to have him on the panel today to discuss the financial considerations in setting up your early career and, uh, and practice. Next up will be Dr. Monica Shukla. Uh, she's a radiation oncologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She did her residency at Cleveland Clinic uh, prior to joining Medical College of Wisconsin in 2014, where she now serves as an assistant professor and associate director of the radiation oncology residency program. She's going to be talking about work-life balance. And finally, we'll have uh, Dr. Michael Roach. Uh, he's a radiation oncologist at the Cancer Center of Hawaii. He trained at uh, the Washington University in St. Louis in radiation oncology and joined the group shortly after serving as an assistant professor and chief of GI Radon. He joined the Cancer Center of Hawaii in 2019 and uh, pleased to have him here today to discuss considerations for choosing a job as well as uh, to discuss transitions. We'll start with Dr. Dr. Royce. Great, thanks. Let me know if you can't hear me and thanks to the organizers for putting this group together. I think we'll have a fun discussion today. So I'm gonna talk about, I'll just dive in about financial considerations and how we can approach uh, our personal financial lives as early career attendings and uh, uh, how to think about this. So we can go ahead and next slide. I wanted to quickly highlight two resources that are actually radiation oncology specific, written by radiation oncologists, and uh, two of the authors are here on our panel today. So the first is this article in PRO that we put together with the white coat investor, James Dahl, um, that covers a lot of the content of the next couple slides here. And then also a book that recently was published on career development, academic radiation oncology, and Dr. Shukla uh, wrote a very nice chapter with Carmen about personal finance and work-life balance. Next slide. So uh, just to kind of level set the, and set context for the conversation, you know, we acknowledge that the future is uncertain. And while medicine remains very well compensated and has traditionally high job security, a low risk profession, the risk isn't zero and the future is unknown. And there are threats, existential threats and, and the sort. I've listed some here like the changing roles of physician extenders or how we might outsource certain medical services. Um, the role that AI might play in the future, private equity, payment reform, telemedicine, consolidation, all these things that would potentially fundamentally change how uh, medicine is structured and reimbursed today. And this is particularly true uh, when we narrow the scope down to certain specialty labor markets that might be more susceptible to market forces. And I've listed a couple examples. We don't have to go into detail unless there are questions about them um, uh, at the moment. Also, there's this burnout epidemic in medicine, and you know there are a lot of numbers that get thrown around, including one more than one out of every two physicians experiencing symptoms of burnout. Uh, the contributors are likely multifactorial, and there's been all sorts published on this topic, but things include the you know the um, uh, the presence of the EMR in medical modern medical care, loss of autonomy, corporization of medicine, and possibly the you know, severe debt loads that young physicians have as they enter the workforce and graduate from their training. 
And so I think we're probably naive if we're a physician and we think that we're not at any risk of burnout. I mean, clearly we're all at some risk and it's quite plausible that financial health could contribute to that. If you have high debt loads, it may um, impact how you approach your job. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Next slide. So this is a busy slide and I apologize for that, but this is kind of the critical concept. And this is idea of um, how to protect ourselves against some of these forces that we just mentioned that might be out of our control. And I'm making the argument today that it could be through this idea of financial independence, which may be familiar to many of you listening. Uh, in short, financial independence is the accumulation of sufficient wealth to permit life without dependency on employment. So you could maintain your desired quality of life without working. And that's basically sort of the finance end game and traditionally what we think of as a retiree aiming for who's no longer working, but is saved enough to live comfortably after employment. But the important concept is that financial independence doesn't have to be limited to someone who's retiring. And in fact, this sort of financial state is, is readily attainable for US physician um, after 15 or 20 years of less in the workforce. And this is this idea of uh, fire or financial independence, retire early. It's sort of a, a, a movement amongst the younger generation. But I'm not really talking about retiring. I'm just talking about financial independence. And the key is that being financially independent permits certain professional, personal, uh, and financial freedoms. And specifically what I mean, some examples is it could relate some, you know, work-related stressors if they're related to financial drivers behind the work. So for example, you could restructure your work hours or your schedule or, you know, liberate yourself from certain practice patterns that might be driven by reimbursement considerations and a fee-for-service model uh, and ultimately hedging against an uncertain future. You could, you know, devote your time and energy towards personal wellness pursuits or more professionally rewarding but less income producing activities like charitable work. Now this is, this is really why we're getting at this topic of financial independence and how it might impact wellness. And you know, the bottom line is it removes work from a necessity to a choice. And uh, this is done by accumulating wealth uh, such that what you own uh, when invested properly can generate enough to live off of um, uh, when considering your expenses. And basically it comes down to saving relative to your costs. Next slide. So healthy personal financial practices are necessary to achieve financial independence and sort of liberate yourself from um, the, uh, the necessity to work for financial considerations. And there are four major tenets of financial health that we break down. Uh, and this is in our PRO article. We break it down number one by debt strategy. And I've listed some sources of debt there. Behavioral strategy how to approach finances, things like savings rate, you know, how much do you spend versus how much do you save? And this critical idea that, you know, your, your wealth, how much you have in terms of assets is not equal to income, which is how much you're making, but may be impacted by how much you're spending. And then there are um, topics that are somewhat complex and often probably beyond the scope of today's talk, but, you know, your investment strategy, what sort of risk profile you're considering uh, in your portfolio, that includes the idea of asset allocations, how much are you holding in stocks versus bonds versus real estate versus cash or otherwise, um, diversifying your investments and then tax considerations. And then asset protection um, strategies, so things like insurance, disability, life insurance, and then estate planning, and uh, uh, most importantly, your physical and mental health. Next slide. So those are kind of the, the key concepts to think of that are gone in more detail in those resources I mentioned at the beginning of these slides. But to round out the conversation, and as we think about passing it on to the other panelists, I'll leave you with this. Number one, we can't predict the future and there are forces beyond our control. Number two, the burnout crisis is multifactorial, but personal financial factors, including debt load, can and likely do play a role for some individuals. Increasing income is of diminishing returns for increasing happiness, but financial health can lead to financial independence, which may facilitate these professional and personal freedoms we mentioned. We talked about sort of the four essential tenets, debt, behavioral, investment, asset protection strategies. And I would argue that initial and continuing financial education is an overlooked but important curriculum component for medical professionals. And there are lots of resources cited in those earlier uh, paper and chapters that um, highlight additional uh, references. The bottom line is, is that with our financial houses in order, we can devote more resources to learning and practicing good medicine while living healthy and rewarding lives.
Hey, thank you, Dr. Royce. That was uh, incredibly insightful. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, we have a, a few questions that were uh, submitted um, with the registration. Um, and one that we were hoping to touch on is, are there any specific resources that you could share with us or point us towards that can help us uh, sort of financial house in order? Yeah, there are a lot of great resources that are specifically targeted for, you know, young professionals and specifically young physicians, and that includes radiation oncologists. Um, the way that I generally think about these resources, and I would certainly welcome the insight of the rest of the panelists, uh, are number one, you know, they're varying complexity. And so depending on your experience and knowledge base, you know, what sort of level you might want to start uh, reading and learning about, uh, the Probably the first place to start would be that chapter I highlighted in the POR article. And then there's some sort of entry level books from the White Coat Investor. He has a very nice series, as well as another physician named William Bernstein, who's a neurologist and now a, a relatively famous um, financial professional. And then within sort of increasing complexity, there are resources from a community called Boggleheads that have their own publications. And then some more sophisticated books that talk about um, sort of investment philosophy and mathematical modeling, again, by William Bernstein and, and others um, that are all highlighted in that PRO, PRO article. That was great, thank you. Um, we have an additional question primarily from uh, some of our new graduates and upcoming new graduates. Um, when we're looking for our first given job contracts, uh, what exactly should we be looking for? And um, there's a question there about uh, what is okay to negotiate at that early time point. Yeah, that's a great question. I might um, hold off on answering that in, in favor of letting uh, Dr. Roach go, because I know he's going to talk quite a bit about some of the um, you know, mechanics of considering jobs and how we're paid as physicians, and that would tie nicely into that. So maybe let's hold on to that one. Does that sound okay, uh, Dr. Roach? Yeah, no, I think that that's good. And I can talk more about it then. I would also just put a plug in uh, the previous Rocket Rover session from December. Uh, we had a, about 20 minute discussion on negotiating tactics from Dr. Nick Zorski. So there's another good resource there. I have a link at the end for that as well. I have a question for, uh, I guess, any of the panelists, but um, a lot of the uh, trainees are you know, simultaneously starting a new job with a new income stream and also perhaps looking at starting a family and uh, potentially buying a house for the first time. And so there's a lot of like financial shifts from living as a resident to what you could live as, as a um, new attending. I, I was just curious um, to hear maybe uh, how you guys navigated that big shift and um, balanced, you know, being financially responsible, but also you know, moving forward in life. Yeah, I can I can comment a little bit on that and then would welcome the thoughts of the other panelists. But, you know, I, I think a good piece of advice is to sort of do nothing for a little bit and kind of get your feet under you. There's going to be a lot of forces at play. You're going to be um, exposed to a lot of new responsibilities um, and complicated professional decisions in life. And you're trying to get to oral boards and, and get through that. So, you know, certainly... Um, try to avoid the temptation to rush into anything. Um, you know, a, a classic sort of line or piece of advice is to quote, live like a resident for the first sort of moments of being an attending. And really that allows you, number one, to get your feet under you. And number two, that gap between your lifestyle that you've established as a resident and your income that you've now suddenly been exposed to as an attending is quite wide. And taking advantage of that gap can allow you to set yourself up for a very successful financial future, particularly if you're doing things like taking that and saving it or paying down debt um, and you know, sort of getting your financial house in order um, as opposed to immediately uh, growing into that um, new source of income and spending it all. Um, one thing that I probably should have mentioned was, um, you know, I, would, I would probably challenge all of us to read maybe one financial uh, resource a year. And that could, there, there are many different ways to do that. It could be on the internet. There are all sorts of good uh, forums and internet communities that talk about this sort of thing. We're just reading one book a year and, uh, you know, throwing yourself out there, stepping outside your comfort zone a little bit and, and doing some of this um, financial, you know, planning that one might want to outsource to professionals just so you get exposed to these um, 
to the, the vocabulary, the language, the, um, the technical things about it, like doing your own taxes, for example. You know, doing this when you're, you know, quote, young or, ha or have a lower income, you know, those sorts of mistakes that you might make are much less costly now than they would be in 30 years from now. And so you may as well, you know, try to run up that learning curve and expose yourself to some of this stuff so that you're educated and knowledgeable and can um, face these issues. Yeah, I'd echo the advice to live like a resident as long as you can. You can still upgrade your life, but uh, saving money, uh, you're not going to make as large of mistakes. I'd also really advocate consider renting. You can still rent a house, but uh, if you buy a house, I feel that's going to be a big tie down. Hopefully your first job is your last job and you love it. But if you have a house, it's going to make it that much tougher to make a transition to maybe something that's better for both uh, personal and professional life. Housing has been going gangbusters lately, but uh, who knows where it's going to be in the future. And then uh, you're tied down with a house you can't sell or you're going to end up underwater and having to pay that. It's going to be a big anchor that might limit your options in the future. Yeah, I was really surprised to see, uh, maybe I was naive about it, but I suspect others are as well, how often people change jobs after the first couple of years. And that includes myself. And, um, you know, you, you want to have some level of flexibility until you're sure you're heading down the right path that will, you know, lead you to a happy life. Sorry, Dr. Shukla, I saw you, you went off mute there. Yeah, no, I, you, you kind of alluded to it right in your question. It's a time of incredible flux when you're building a family and buying a house and doing all this stuff. And so letting all of those things kind of settle down so that you can make good decisions. You might, you know, buy your, you know, in, in a nice new car that you wanted, and then you have two kids and you need an SUV, you know, in less than two years, right? Like let the, let things settle down and get in and get into more of a steady state before, um, uh, kind of making some of those bigger decisions. So I agree with, you know, holding a steady state for a little bit before you can make some more permanent choices. It really gets back to this idea of, you know, delayed gratification, which if we're honest with us, we're all experts at, you know, after going through the rigorous and long, arduous path of medical education, where all your friends have, you know, sort of crossed different life milestones, you know, a couple, a, a year or two, at least to get through oral boards before you jump into some of these things, um, you know, will give you stronger ground to stand on. Great. I think we can move on to the next section, uh, which will be work-life balance from Dr. Shukla. All right, here we go. Talking from a point of uh, being a, a work in progress myself. So, all right, so a few topics engender as much interest as work-life balance. I feel like you say that and everybody's ears perk up. Uh, everybody's in search of work-life balance, but few seem to feel over the course of their career that they've achieved that. An imbalance of work and life, it's an important issue for residents, but it's, you know, pretty true for much of the U.S. professional workforce. There's ever-increasing demands on all of us to be productive and present at all times, um, and that, that uh, you know, expectation certainly fuels the imbalance that we're all feeling. It's a long journey to become a practicing physician. Um, and as a student or trainee, there's often the hope, well, it's going to get better over time. I'll have much more balance in a few more years. Um, and it does in many ways, you have much more control over your schedule and sort of, you know, what you choose to be involved in as an attending, but, you know, life fills up with other responsibilities uh, uh, and things change over time. So, um, you know, particularly for people that are starting a family or maybe caring for older, you know, uh, parents that are uh, whose you know, health may not be as good as it was, it might be particularly hard to achieve this balance. So in this short talk, I want to just share some of the things that I've learned along the way that have uh, helped me adapt uh, to starting a career as an attending and then kind of, you know, uh, finding balance and sort of early mid-career. All right, so I just wanna start with this, you know, how do you know when your life is out of balance? Um, if your life is out of a reasonable, reasonable balance, you may start feeling or experiencing, you know, loss of interest in things that you were interested in before, or a general lack of wanting to engage, you might feel, lack of focus. You might be more inefficient than you were before. You might feel particularly less confident or fearful of doing something new. Um, you may just not feel well. I don't, you know, decrease sense of well-being and then, you know, feeling a lack of control, like you can't control the circumstances in your life. You know, you <laughs> listen to some of these things. I feel like, you know, many of us are like, yeah, I feel like I can't control my circumstances. Um, but if you're feeling these kind of in a deep, 
you know, uh, kind of serious way, especially many of these things, um, it can be helpful to speak to somebody professional, somebody like a counselor or a psychiatrist. You can discreetly access resources through the employee assistance program. It's called the EAP at some institutions or EAR at other institutions. And usually in graduate medical programs, the, the administrative arm offers several programs specific to residents. Like for example, at our institution, we have like three unbilled uh, well-being counseling sessions unbilled per academic year, right? And any additional um, sessions that you might need beyond that are provided at a prorated rate. Many GME organizations uh, uh, have that and have like kind of increased access uh, and number of visits allowed, especially during the pandemic where I think a lot of people had, you know, kind of coping issues. So how from here, uh, what can we do to proactively start uh, on a better path towards a healthier work-life balance? I think that's the next slide. So there are some habits that you can develop to put into practice on, the, on a daily basis. And there's other more like macroscopic themes uh, to help you achieve a better balance. So here are some of the things to consider doing on a macroscopic level to achieve better work-life balance. The first most important is goal setting. So it's very critical to develop a vision around what you'd like your work and home life to look like in five years and 10 years and 20 years. And that's very critical in directing um, your efforts in the short term. So if a colleague, you know, comes by or a mentor comes by and, uh, you know, presents to you an opportunity, um, if you have a clear vision of what, where you want to go, you're more likely to take that on thoughtfully or decline it thoughtfully. Um, so if you want to be, you know, a, an expert in prostate cancer, you, that's your passion. And somebody says, you know, I've got this uh, PCI chapter that needs to be done. Right. If you're very clear about like where you want your career to head, even though it's hard to say no to a mentor, we all have a hard time saying no, you'll be more thoughtfully saying no. If you can be aware of your colleagues and what they're interested in, you can hand this opportunity to someone that, you know, they're a budding lung expert and this might be helpful for their career. I think when you kind of reach out to other people and thoughtfully hand them opportunities, they're likely to return the favor and give you something that's helpful in kind of, you know, helping you build your life where, um, you know, where you, where you'd like to see it go. Um, and then pouring your efforts into the things that you say, I want to accomplish this in five years, you're going to be much more likely to achieve your goals by five years, 10 years, and, and 20 years. Um, the second thing to consider is um, reflection. And this is not sort of sitting around and, you know, I've got a little bit of time, I'm going to think about things, but regular, organized, scheduled reflection. Um, in the beginning, when you're doing this goal setting and reflection uh, process, it should ideally be like quarterly or at least biannually. You want to set a time in your calendar and keep this appointment with yourself, just as you keep an appointment with a colleague. Um, but in this time, sit down with yourself and try to figure out the following. What are your natural affinities? What are your unique talents? Um, is there something that you know about that other, others in your department don't? Are there certain platforms that you're familiar with that other people don't have experience with? Um, you know, and then, you know, ultimately, what are you passionate about, you know, professionally and personally, you know? And then kind of what sorts of tasks do you like to do? Are you a numbers person and you like to be with an Excel sheet? Are you someone that likes to be engaged with, with people? Um, I think if you can reflect on uh, what your unique talents are, it'll help you bring value to the department that you're in, the practice that you're in, and allow you to carve out a niche for yourself where you're doing what you love on a daily basis. Some people are pretty intuitive about a process like this. They kind of know what they're good at and not. And some people need to be a little bit more objective. So there are resources out there like finding your strength type of um, worksheets that help you figure this out in a more mechanical way. And then at each subsequent reflection session, you go back and you look at what tasks have I accomplished? What are those that remain a work in progress? You know, what did you plan for? And what things didn't you do? Why didn't you get them done? Is it because you didn't find them interesting? So you didn't you know, if you found it hard to devote effort that way, well, maybe that's something that comes off your to-do list and no longer, no longer is something that you're working toward. Or is it something that you're passionate about and you just couldn't find the time to get it done? Maybe you need to allocate more time towards it, but you're being a little bit more deliberate about getting the things done that you want to get done. The third thing is being a little bit strategic um, in trying to get your goals accomplished. Um, it's important to realize that not everything is equally important. Uh, so when you set these goals out, you say, okay, these are the most important. These are of moderate importance. These are not so important, but they've got to get done. 
And the things that you care about, get them done, get them done with care, do them with detail and everything else uh, in order of priority, get them done and maybe don't spend as much time getting those things accomplished. Um, focus on tasks that yield disproportionate results. Let's say you are interested in um, educational leadership at, the, at your local medical school. And there's a committee you know, that you can serve on once a month that allows you to connect it to people that can help you further your career in that direction. That's a good investment of your time. It's one hour a month um, and allows you to you know, uh, you know, be exposed to a bunch of new mentors. You know, that would be a good use of your time. So being strategic in terms of like how much time you're putting in and you know, what, you're, what you're obtaining from that, from that, um, uh, from that commitment. Understanding your natural work habits is important. Are you a morning person? Are you a night person? Are you a group oriented person? Are you an individual person? Um, it'll allow you again to start selecting things that you know that you're you're better at. Some people tend to derail, you know, like mid afternoon. Their afternoon kind of goes awry. Maybe when you're in attending, you block off more time during your noon hour to recollect yourself, close everything, you know, close all your notes from the morning and then approach your afternoon with organization. Maybe you need that. Maybe you're totally a morning person. Start your clinic at like eight or nine instead of at seven or, you know, however your clinic works to expand the time in the morning where you're most productive. So there are things that you can do to modify your day and schedule to make you the most efficient that you can be. Um, and then, uh, be organized and plan ahead, you know, create a list of things to do on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, as organized as you can be, you're more likely to get things done. All right, so on the next slide, I wanted to focus a little bit more on habits that you can implement on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so approach each day with organization. So just as you're doing this kind of um, goal setting on a day, week, month basis, with each day, I think it's helpful to create like an opening routine and a closing routine. The opening routine starts with your list of things to do. The, this is what I'm gonna get done. This is when I'm gonna get done. And then when you close your day, you re revisit that to-do list. What did I get done? What did I not get done? And create your to-do list for the following day. I think opening routine and closing routine is helpful. Um, the next thing is set limits on what you agree to do. So if you look at, somebody's asking you to add on a consult, you're looking at your Tuesday schedule. I don't know where I'm gonna add this on. I, I just don't think I can do this. You say no, say no and move on. Don't perseverate on it. Don't try to see where else you can get it on. Just thoughtfully decline it and then move on and don't uh, feel worry and guilty about it. You're gonna be sort of using more brain cells that can be, you can be doing different stuff with that. Just be thoughtful. Um, and if you say you can't do it, just move on. All right, try to achieve more work-related tasks during work hours. I was the worst at this in residency. I did not have a family in residency. I loved my co-residents. The resident room was really noisy. Um, and I was like, well, I'll just get this done at home. It's quieter there, okay? But then you're spending your unplugged time closing notes and doing work-related tasks. So my co-resident could get work done in a war zone. And I should have not gone back to the resident room when I had 15 or 20 minutes free and stayed in the workstation and gotten my notes closed. But it was tempting to co go back and you know share your case and pick somebody's brain about something, um, but sort of know yourself. And uh, if you can achieve work at work, you'll have more hours to completely unplug. And if you can completely unplug and engage in different type of stuff, you're gonna approach your next day with more clarity with new ideas, with new inspiration. Uh, so if you can use your time wisely in those spheres, it's, 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 it's better. Don't excessively multitask. Um, to a degree, like this is not controllable. You're checking films at a Linux, you have a consult in a room, your colleague pages you to answer a question, you can't control that. But to the degree that you can look ahead and avoid traffic jams that totally de derail your thought process and let tasks pile up, Try to, try to look ahead and avoid traffic jams in your schedule, okay? Um, and sometimes good enough is good enough. A perfect example is, uh, you know, over editing an email to the point of perfection before sending it. We're all guilty of it. Fine, you're asking for a salary raise, you're sending an email to the CMO, right? Edit your email, make it look perfect for everything else. Get your point across and get it done. The most efficient people in the department, TY for thank you, they sign everything with initials. 
they answer you in one sentence. Don't obsess about things uh, that are not that important, just get them done. And uh, the last thing is taking care of yourself. So I'll be a little bit more concrete about this. It's super important to get sleep. Proper sleep hygiene, it improves your focus and concentration at work. It allows you to fully enjoy your leisure time. Uh, sleep is, is a very critical thing. Meditation is something that uh, it's an exercise of being concentrated uh, on one specific topic. If you can work meditation into your life, it allows you probably to focus on the tasks that you have at work a little bit more uh, clearly and efficiently. Um, good nutrition, regular exercise, engaging in your hobbies. Please take all of your vacation. Um, uh, you know, I used to bunch things up and take longer vacations. And I've noticed myself as I've kind of uh, accumulated more responsibilities, I need shorter bursts of time off scattered throughout the year versus like chunks of like one or two weeks off. Uh, so uh, take all of your vacation. All right. So on the next slide, I've got a bunch of resources and books that have been super helpful. Um, this one in particular by Cal Newport, it's not even that new anymore, but it has kind of brought to a science the idea of stitching together small chunks of time into one bigger chunk of time to allow you to think more deeply, to have to allow you to have more creative thoughts versus sort of like shifting the chairs on the deck. Um, it allows you to be a little bit more deeply thoughtful and creative. So some of these things are a little bit more mechanical um, and help you in a more concrete way. Some of these things are a little bit more like, uh, like theoretical. Um, and then the next uh, page are uh, podcasts that I listen to in particular. I like this first one. Uh, I've been listening to it more recently. It's about time. They're 20 minute segments. And she, you know, she basically tells you a lesson in that 20 minute segment. It's super digestible on like a commute to work. Organizing to-do apps, I use Microsoft to-do. Um, that's a good one, but these to-do apps are super helpful, electronic form um, and meditation apps here. Uh, all right. And I think the, the punchline is not uh, trying to figure out how you can work less and live more. It's trying to figure out how to be fulfilled at work and in home life and everything in between. They shouldn't be competing choices, but they should complement each other. Um, and, uh, um, you know, time is your greatest asset. I think it, as, as organized as you can be and um, thinking about how you spend your time, I think that's, that uh, provides the biggest dividends. Great, thank you so much. That was those were great slides. Um, uh, just kind of building off your your point about saying no thoughtfully, could you share uh, like the language you use to communicate that to people coming to you? Because I think that's, I mean, as a resident, certainly something we struggle with. But I imagine it it might even be harder as a, a junior faculty member when you're trying to, you know, get your foot in the door and establish yourself. So, how, do you have any examples for how how you actually say that? You know, it's hard. It's hard as a resident. It's hard as a junior faculty. Usually people that are giving you opportunities like 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 you and, and see the potential in you. Um, you know, I don't know that I've like I've got a certain scripting for it. Um, but I think if you're honest and say, you know, I, I really would like to, you know, focus a little bit on, you know, this particular aspect. And I don't necessarily know if I've got, you know, you know, the bandwidth to take this on. And it doesn't necessarily serve uh you know, where I see my career heading. Somebody might, you know, be a little bit miffed, you know, maybe, you know, but I think people actually respect you if you are being very clear about what it is that you want. Um, and I don't know, I've, I feel like we've got a lot of great mentors in our field. And the best way that my chairman kind of told me to think about things as like, what is the story that you want to tell about yourself when you go up for promotion? Like, what is the theme? What are the two or three themes? If you were about to communicate to yourself about somebody else, like, what did you accomplish? What are you passionate about? And if it's not fitting in the story that you want to tell about yourself in seven to 10 years, then, then pass it up. And I think the best thing is to maybe like, try to have somebody else in mind. That's kind of like a soft no. Uh, you know, I, I'm not interested in this particular thing, but I do have a colleague that I think is. Great. Um, another question maybe for uh, Dr. Roach could chime in on this, but someone submitted a question beforehand about uh, the differences in work-life balance and protecting your time when you 
have residents or mid levels and when you don't uh, and kind of what differences there are and how to protect your time, maybe more on the, the private practice side of things. Do you have any, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, first, I'd like to really echo what she said is to get your work done at work. There's a lot of social opportunities, both private practice and academics, but try to get your work done at work so that when you go home, uh, it's, it's a time for you and uh, who you care about. Uh, I think for work-life balance, uh, there's a lot of uh, like preparations key. And I think trying to uh, direct your staff that like these days are dedicated to these uh, patient activities so that everyone that knows uh, what can go where. Uh, if you can't control your, I think setting firm limits on your uh, schedule uh, early on is going to really help with that. Like I do uh, my on-treatment visits uh, and follow-ups on Monday because I know that's when patients are going to have their problems. I've dedicated procedure days and then usually trying to uh, you know, schedule, leave some time open for either like the add-ons or uh, to prepare. I think uh, preparing for your consults is uh, is key. It's something you know we're, you're good as, as a resident, but I think uh, preparing as an attending, particularly for the more complicated things, knowing like oh this isn't uh, necessarily a, you know a straightforward uh, patient, looking in advance, tracking down the imaging. It's uh, using what time you have to to prepare. What is what I would say. There was another question. Uh that someone submitted about uh, oral board studying during first year. Dr. Royce kind of brought this up as you know one of the reasons not to splurge financially, but that definitely has a an impact on work life balance and quality of life that first year. Uh, could uh, Dr. Royce, could you or Dr. Shukla, uh, just chime in on kind of how you balance that during that first year? Yeah, I mean. Um... Oral boards, is, it's just a sort of odd moment in your life where you're not a resident, but you also don't really feel like a full attending because you still have this oral boards to get through. Um, you know, you kind of just have to embrace it and you learn an incredible amount by the oral boards preparation process. And, you know, as it's as many people say, it's sort of the peak of your clinical rat on capabilities is like that moment after oral boards where you've really, you know, well-rounded yourself across disease sites, things that you might see routinely and things that you wouldn't see routinely. Um, I think, you know, you could take solace in that the great majority of people pass. And so almost everybody does the correct thing for studying for oral boards, whatever that thing is, you know, and often that involves, you know, getting in study groups and, and getting to know some of your peers and learning from each other, which, you know, actually is, um, you know, there's a camaraderie and a spirit of core around the oral boards, which is um, satisfying in its own way. So, you know, I try to caution people not to get too worked up about oral boards because most people do well, but it is incredibly stressful and it's just a process that we go through, but hopefully we come out the other end uh, as better doctors. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, when you start your career, it's not, um, I, I'll, I guess I'll speak for myself. You know, some people might work, walk into full, full, complete schedules. I didn't. Um, and it gave me a little bit of time to ramp up. Um, I was also pretty, most people are, you have a board study schedule and we started it in January and we did content review for the first like two thirds of our study period. And then the last, you know, one third was just running cases, 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 cases. It's just being able to like talk about it in a very cogent way, in a way that you understand what you're saying, you know, cause there's like the, the script part of it where you memorize something that you're saying, but if somebody like tries to poke you too much, you have like no idea what you're saying. You're like, oh, this angle, that thing, you know, like it's actually like, the, the point right before people get to boards, like people start to really like actualize the information. They really understand what they're saying. That's ultimately where you want to get. So content review, I think is key early, early on getting through all the content that you totally understand it and then running cases and saying things so that you're not like tripping over what you're saying. And then you really understand what you're saying. Great. Thank you, Dr. One thing that I'll add to that is, oh. you know, just to emphasize that, um, you know, your colleagues are generally very understandable that you're going through oral boards and will help support you and setting apart, you know, dedicated time to prepare um, is, is the way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I put together several like study days. Like I think we had like 
some, some like two to three study days that were given. And I like coupled it with like a couple days of vacation, coupled it with a weekend. I ended up having like at least seven to 10 days of study time before boards um, and keeping a schedule. And, you know, call people up, have them run cases with you. You might have mock orals in the de department that you're in, but your old attendings will be very, very happy to take half an hour, half an hour out of their time. If you give them enough uh, like heads up and just say, can you run like five breast cases with me? Great, thank you very much. Uh, we're hoping to move to our next section with uh, Dr. Roach, who's speaking about considerations for picking a job and transitions. Okay, so first I'm gonna kind of go over, I think this was what the, uh, an earlier question was, what are the jobs that are available out there, both when you're graduating resident and then if you're trying to uh, think about maybe uh, picking uh, a different career, so we can go to the next slide. So uh, the first uh, is uh, what I'm in now is private practice. It's generally a group of physicians who banded together uh, as a group to serve uh, patients. And there's kind of two for radiation oncology. One is where you collect professional revenue only. And oftentimes these uh, groups have a service contract where they're gonna provide radiation oncology services for a hospital or a center or a rarer type of group gets both professional and technical revenue from uh, delivering the treatments themselves. Now, kind of what's the difference? Professional revenue is what you get as a doctor for seeing a patient doing certain tasks, like seeing a consult, seeing a follow-up, seeing an on-treatment visit. Some things that are purely technical is like what's billed to deliver a treatment, like an IMRT treatment, a 3D plan. Then there's other types of things that are a mix. And one uh, example that I have on the right is a, an IMRT plan. If you look at it, uh, what you'll see is that the 2-6 modifier uh, shows you what gets billed for the uh, patient or what gets, goes to the physician. And then the other portion is the technical, what uh, is supposed to cover your dosimetry time, your RE or eclipse license, things of that nature. And where I got this from is every, uh, everything you do in clinic has a code and for an IMRT plan at 77301, you can pull this up in ARIA uh, under the activity capture. And then this is a reimbursement of what Medicare pays. That's uh, kind of one standard that you can look up online. Private payers are generally a little more, Medicare or Medicaid's a little less, uh, but those are kind of dependent on what your institution negotiates. You can look up any code, and then you can also look up the specific uh, location. I pulled up what we do here uh, in Hawaii. So these are private practice. You also have employed models in, uh, within a hospital. You can be employed by an academic medical center, or you might be employed by a multi-specialty uh, uh, group uh, that uh, tends to be freestanding, but it has built-in referrings, like it might be you with a medical oncologist, it might be you uh, with uh, radiologists, it can be a diverse group. So we can go to the uh, next slide. Uh, so how are you gonna be paid? This is uh, pretty important to understand as a new physician. You could be paid a straight salary. That's pretty rare, because uh, usually uh, your employer wants you to have some sort of incentive to work harder, but how you get that uh, incentive uh, is gonna vary uh, place to place. It might be based on what is charged to the patient. It might be based on something called a relative value unit. All those codes for everything we do uh, as a physician has a certain amount of relative value units attached to it. Each relative value unit uh, by Medicare is uh, roughly under $35 right now. So you can go back and look at that IMRT plan, see that it's uh, billed, and then kind of divide that up by 35 to see how many RBUs are attached to that. So generally, the busier you are, the more you're going to charge, the more RVUs you're going to have. A lot of uh, centers tend to do uh, RVUs because that's something that uh, there's an easy reference for it, and it's the same no matter where you're at. Another metric that you might get a bonus on is based on collections. Your center might bill a certain amount for a procedure, but what actually gets paid? Again, different payers are going to pay you different amounts. Uh, your uh, bonus might be dependent on quality metrics. Maybe it's patient satisfaction. Maybe uh, in academics, it's based on how many publications, uh, like presentations you make. So yeah, every center is going to have a different blend on how uh, you can get a bonus. There's also uh, kind of the hunting analogy term that gets thrown around. It's eat what you kill. 
This is uh, uh, more common in private practice where it's based on the revenue that's coming in from your collections. Uh, this is kind of the highest risk, highest reward. You know, if you go out for a sabbatical, you're not going to be uh, making any money based off that. But uh, kind of uh, no matter where you're at, uh, collection base, like that's how your department's going to be uh, running itself. So it's pretty important to understand what's your uh, bonus. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So these are real offers that me and my classmates got back in 2016, just to kind of illustrate the different uh, incentive models. Uh, one of us got offered a rural hospital in the Midwest where the base salary was 450,000. And then for every uh, build relative value unit above 8,000, they would get $60. Well, Medicare is only paying like $35 per relative value unit. Why are they paying more? Well, uh, that's for the professional there's probably roughly like three or four uh, technical relative value units for everything we do professionally. There's more money to be made on the technical side. So they were willing to pay more than they're actually getting for his services so that uh, to incentivize him because they were still gonna be making a profit on the technical side. Uh, in a city hospital, another uh, uh, member of my class got offered 400,000 base salary for year one, 450 base salary for year two, and then after that, they got a certain percent of the collections that were made on the professional component. They didn't get all of it because there's overhead. You've got to pay for billers uh, to collect the fees. Also, like what you're paying for, you know, nursing, other sort of staff. Now, if you're in a group, uh, collection-based metrics like this can lead to fighting over better insured patients. Uh, you generally want the patients with private insurance versus, say, Medicaid or uninsured. So this can lead to conflicts if some uh, physicians are seeing uh, other types of patients versus another, because they're gonna be uh, getting paid more uh, for doing the same amount of work. Another offer was a private group uh, that did professional uh, services only that contracted with multiple hospitals, whereas a physician who just joined, you'd get paid 300,000 base salary for two years, and then you would do a $100,000 buy-in. They did have financing for that, and then after that, everyone evenly divided up the professional collections after overhead. So in a group, if you're dividing up everything equally, the conflict with this uh, kind of setup is some people might be busier than others, but they're effectively getting paid less or, uh, per amount of time that they're having to invest. Uh, a buy-in like this, uh, for a professional group only, sometimes there's not a buy-in at all. It's considered sweat equity. You know, We probably made more money off you the first two years. We like you, we want you to join. Since we're professional collections only, there's not really anything to buy in on, so you might not even have one. But if you're at a center where you control the machines, uh, you're gonna be buying more in. It's, you can also think of it, you're like buying stock uh, in a company and the buy-in might be more. Another like example of an academic offer was a 285,000 base salary with an annual bonus based on collections minus a dean's tax. Uh, so that kind of comes down to the overhead issue again. Here in private practice, uh, we have to pay for our billers, the office staff for them, uh, things like that. It's not too expensive, but the dean's tax and a chairman's tax uh, for this center was around 40%. And that's the money that gets divvied up for like research efforts. Uh, you know, not all physicians are gonna cover their salary. So that's things like uh, that. So we can move on to the next slide. So hopefully again, your first job's uh, the only job that you love it, but if you decide you want to make a change after doing the reflection uh, that we uh, talked about in earlier sections, uh, it's a big decision to make. So kind of a one way to frame the analysis is looking at like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So both the current job and a job that you're considering, uh, think deeply about what do you like? What's unique about that job that wouldn't be there at other places? What do you dislike about both the opportunities? What might be missing both professionally and personally at either opportunity? What do you dislike doing? Maybe you hate Bracky, but this new job is gonna expect you to take on some of that uh, procedures. What are there trends in the field? What do you have that you can offer that's unique? I'll be honest, one thing that got me my job here was the fact that I had a lot of experience with radio pharmaceuticals and MRI guided treatment with my job as GI chief. So that was something that uh, this group was looking at potentially doing, and that gave me a leg up on the competition. One thing to also think about, what's the competition doing at both the jobs you're considering? Can you trust the uh, physicians and staff that you're gonna be working with? So we can move on to the next slide. 
So when I decided to make the leap from academics to private, these were things that I was, uh, questions I was considering. So uh, the physicians of the group I was joining, did I feel like I was compatible with them when I interviewed? Is there a lot of turnover at either of the groups? Do I feel like the group I'm joining, like they have a good knowledge base? What's the peer review? Like, I think one important thing to do on a job interview is try to sit through chart rounds. It gives you a sense of how invested uh, they are in quality. It also gives you a very quick uh, overview of our patients being treated the way you did. Are like bone mets getting like 30 fractions? things like that. What's the hierarchy like? Are the senior doctors controlling the group and then everyone else uh, has to do a lot of the work for them? Maybe you don't wanna work with anyone. Maybe you want a solo opportunity. What's the support staff like? Is there a lot of tur uh, turnover? Are you using a lot of locums, nurses, and physicists? Do they seem open to new treatment methods? What's the technology available? Do the physicians get a say with who they work with? At the university was, I was at, I was lucky I had an awesome nurse, but she got right assigned to me. I didn't get any say uh, for who I worked with. What are the referrings like? Are they uh, practicing good medicine? Uh, are they collegial? How's, how are consults assigned? What's the division of labor? Is it like the front desk deciding where things go? Uh, how, how's vacation and call coverage done? Do you have to, if you're in a small center, do you have to uh, work with a locums company, try to find someone to cover you? Is vacation and call covered equally? What's the work-life balance for the people there? What's the reputation of the center uh, that you're thinking of joining? Uh, what are the opportunities at either? Uh, is a leadership role something that's important to you? Is a new title something that's important to you? Uh, how does partnership work? Are people actually being made partners? I felt very comfortable because at this group, the past three people who had all joined became partners without issue. Are academic uh, pursuits important to you? Do you, are you interested in teaching, publishing? Or can you enroll on national clinical trials? Uh, what are tumor boards like? I think this is another thing that's important to try to do on your interview. It gives you a sense of like the medicine that's being practiced and how, uh, what are the relationships like? Uh, are there opportunities to collaborate, socialize outside of work? What are the future plans of uh, both the centers that you're thinking of joining? What are the threats? If it's a private group, are they gonna sell out? Or do they, are they gonna lose their service contract with the hospital? Do you think the hospital just wants to have employed doctors and doesn't want a freestanding center? What's the competition like? Is a university setting up a new shop right across from your private group? Are they buying up private groups and making everyone professors? Uh, is an insurance, are the contracts being closed? Like they only wanna have one group in a city uh, on their uh, contract. Are there any lawsuits pending? What's the press like? And then are patients numbers stable? Are they going up, going down? Things like that. Those were all questions that were going through my mind as I made the leap from the academic center where I trained and knew everything to uh, a center out here in the middle of the Pacific. So we can go to the next slide. So uh, one other question I often get asked is, I was a specialist, I treated lung cancer, and then I was also uh, our GI chief at our university. And now here in private practice, I treat everything. So I've got, been asked a lot, how did, I make the transition back into being a generalist. I think one great resource is NCC and guidelines that get updated continuously. There's a lot of uh, text uh, for both. It's one thing you can hand to patients and talk because at a, I felt like at the university center, there was like the way that we uh, treated everything, but there's a lot uh, more diversity out, uh, outside of that. And this kind of gives you a sense. Uh, one resource that's uh, relatively new over the past few years, which I think is fantastic, I have no stake in it, is the MedNet. A lot of patient presentations aren't too clear. There's a lot of gray zone. And uh, a lot of times, uh, like I search and like the question I have has already been answered. Uh, I went from treating lung and GI to going back and treating everything. I feel eContour is a great resource. I think it's free, uh, is fantastic. And then one thing also to stay on top of the uh, research that's coming out is something called Quad Shot. Every day they send out about two or three different uh, updates on research that's coming out. Uh, I think conferences are good. Uh, things like this, various specialties have refreshers in various locations. And I think uh, one valuable thing too is also contouring workshops that uh, go on. Thank you very much, Dr. Roach. Uh, we have a um, submitted question here. I was hoping to bring it up to you. Um, they're asking, I know that there's a difference in billing based on whether a site is freestanding or hospital-based. And the question is, 
is one better to uh, one better to work for uh, for other for one or the other from a physician compensation perspective. Is there a preferred site on a physician compensation perspective? Uh, so hospital based uh, tends to have a bigger network and they also tend to get paid more because they also offer more services. A hospital can also charge a patient oftentimes a facility fee on top of uh, the usual uh, code that I showed, like for an IMRT plan, they could charge a facility fee on top of the treatment. So there's more uh, revenue to go around to reimburse physicians. But just because the hospital's making more doesn't necessarily mean they're going to uh, share it with you. They also, uh, with a bigger network, you have more clout with uh, the private uh, insurances to uh, get uh, better negotiated rates than a uh, like uh, freestanding center. That's why you see kind of a lot of uh, universities and private centers expanding their network because with more uh, patients they control, you have more uh, negotiating room with private insurances. Medicare is gonna pay the same regardless. Thank you. Uh, another question that was raised was um, when joining a private practice mid-career from either academics or hospital-based employment, do you typically salary like a new grad for uh, a few years or can you come in as a partner? Uh, so that's all open uh, to negotiation. Oftentimes there is going to be at least uh, a trial period, but they could let you come in uh, directly as partner. I did have uh, like one uh, colleague I know who did that. For me, uh, they uh, shortened the time to partnership uh, since I already had experience uh, and I think you have more negotiating room. But another thing you might run into is, you know, like the last two or three partners, this was the contract they got. Uh, why, why should you get something uh, differently? But I do think coming in mid-career, uh, there's, there's negotiating room. Um, one thing uh, we recently hired, we we're expanding our group, uh, we're looking forward to our seventh member joining. Uh, there was uh, a lot of negotiation uh, people did on those first two years. And I think with a private group, yes, you need to feel like you're being compensated appropriately, but your whole job is to, uh, your, your main goal should be getting to partner and understanding how, how that happens. That would be one thing I uh, would kind of keep in focus if you're set on uh, private practice. It can be kind of a turnoff uh, if there's a like an excessive amount of negotiation on like the details of those first two years, your your whole job is to become a partner. Thank you. That, oh. and it, that sounds you know related to an earlier question, and I don't remember the exact specifics of it, but I believe it was regarding what might reasonably be negotiated coming out of training. Is that did I capture that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to come back to that, make sure we answer that question. And I think uh, uh, opinions probably differ on this, and it depends on what sort of group you're joining and what phase of your career you are. But coming directly out of training and joining, say, you know, a medium to large sized academic group, which was my case, you know, I felt the idea of negotiation to be a little bit of a myth and that the contract is often standardized amongst faculty members and they've hired, you know, X number of attendings in the last decade and everyone had the same contract and that sort of thing. So um, I would focus maybe more on the fit of the job than the actual specifics that one might be able to negotiate in or out, if that makes sense. And I welcome the panelists' thoughts on that as well. I totally agree. I mean, I came right out of residency and, and took the job that I'm still at now. This is like starting my seventh or eighth year here. And there was very little that could actually be negotiated. So we have all these, you know, kind of talks about, you know, you should hire a lawyer and you should negotiate this and that. There was nothing to be negotiated, even like the restrictive covenants and things like that. Uh, they were set in stone. The mileage was set in stone. The years were set in stone. Um, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, knowing that now, I mean, you have to focus on the things that you can, can change and are a little bit more meaningful. People were kind of getting stuck on like, oh, I want my education fund to be bigger. Like, does that really make you happier on a day-to-day -day basis? Right. You know, making sure you have the proper support, you know, day-to-day -day in clinic is going to make you a much happier person rather than like making sure your educational fund is like, you know, level with your co-residents who's being hired at another institution. So I think focusing on the things that, you know, um, 
are going to make, make you happy on a day to day uh, are the, the real things to consider when you're picking a job. Yeah, I agree for the big centers. There's often not a lot of room, like everyone's academic funds, the same vacation set the same. I think for uh, private, you know, there might be some room for negotiation on the salary. But again, if everyone's gotten the same contract before you, it's going to be tough. Uh, you, you might, uh, you could see about uh, maybe uh, parental leave, uh, questions like that, uh, time off for boards, uh, if that's not included. Uh, I think there, there's some time on kind of the softer things. Maybe you're moving uh, expenses. Those are some ways to kind of get some uh, extra funds uh, that you could think about uh, negotiating. Start date, things like that. Yeah, definitely up to negotiation yeah. options. Really I think, oh. you know, at the end of the day, that first job, a lot of it comes down to just trust and the contract is, you know, we like to think of the contract as this ironclad document, but it's really just words on a piece of paper and um, you really uh, need to be able to trust who you're joining and feel good about it uh, and rely less on the words in the document. Great. Well, I think we're at the top of the hour. Um, so thanks to the panelists. That was a fantastic discussion on all three topics. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out. Um, this was a three part session. So if anybody watching uh, didn't catch the first two um, in October, we had a, a session on CVs, cover letters and job talks. It was fantastic. Um, and then in December, we had one about uh, networking and, and negotiating contracts that was a little more in depth than we were able to go in this particular session. Um, so check those out. They're both on the Rover website. The link is right there. And then uh, just a little shout out, uh, next month, uh, we're gonna do a um, Rover session on oligometastatic disease. Um, we'll share the link on, on social media and the website shortly. Um, so thanks again to everybody. And I think we can close off. Thanks again, this was awesome. Thanks guys.